and we're going to do it. But uh, we've got several people that are going to be coming. So uh, Sister Yvonne's going to be coming. I know Brother Wesley's coming. My mother's coming. So if y'all want to go ahead and come on up to the table, Sister Christy was going to be up there with us. But unfortunately, she was not able to be here tonight. She's going to attend to Hannah. And so she was not able to be here tonight. But we're having a uh, question and answer on prayer. Now listen, guys. God will not, without prayer, do anything that he's promised to do with prayer, by prayer, and through prayer. If we're going to have revival in this land, we're going to have revival only by prayer. If we're going to see the grace of God, the glory of God, the mercy of God, if we're going to see a thousand souls saved, none of those things are going to happen unless we are a people of prayer. The only way we're going to see the heavens opened up, I, I seldom have ever found a single place in history where there was a group of people minding their own business, going their own way, absolutely not involved in prayer, and God just unzipped the heavens and dumped revival on them. Yes. Right. That's right. Has anybody found that one in the history books? Brother John, you found that revival in the history books? Absolutely not. But when you find a praying people who come together in one mind and one accord, when you find intercessors who are willing to put in the time on their knees before the face of the Father, then you find places where the heavens have been opened up and the glory of God has been revealed on the face of the earth and lives Amen. are utterly changed because people pray. Yes. And the reason we decided to do this tonight is so many times prayer sounds so simple, but when you try to get started, it's so daunting. You say, well, you know, I don't know how to pray, what to pray, how do I do this, that, and whatever prayer. How much do I need to pray? Is five minutes good? Is ten minutes better? You know, all these different questions. And so uh, we're going to be having a question and answer. Luke's going to actually be emceeing the service tonight, I guess is what you'd call that. Uh, overseeing, asking the questions. How would you term that? Leading the show. Luke's going to come be leading the show, not asking the questions. Then you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions. So he's going to be posing the questions that have already been given. We've got about, I think, nine questions that are or ten that's already come in. that are going to be posed to the panel. Um, and then each person on the panel will have an opportunity to, to respond to those questions. And then once that's done, if you have questions about prayer, if you have questions about anything about prayer, you're going to have the opportunity to ask those questions. Our goal with this tonight is to make you active prayer warriors. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. To make you someone who spends time in prayer and not just spend time in prayer, but quality time in quality prayer. Yes. That we might truly open the heavens. We long for souls here. We long for revival. And so, again, that's what this is all about tonight. So, Luke, go ahead and come on, take your place. I'll go up there, get on the panel, and, uh, and then we'll just go over there. I'll tell you guys how I got this job. <laughs> More to be the, the, just be the preacher, sir? It's a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually playing. You got a question? Yeah. All three. Oh, all three. oh I forgot the all three. <laughs> it's all behind the podium. I want my blessing. <laughs> <laughs> I want my blessing. I want mine too.
So my first question is, do you pray at a set time? Do you have a, an amount of time that you try to, to reach daily? Um, how do you go about that? Well, for myself, ooh, I'm really loud. In fact, loud is not up there. Up here. Mine ain't on. It's only the monitors. So it sounds like there. I just got real quiet. Okay, so can y'all hear me enough for me to answer the question? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So the question was again: Do you have set time, and are you, are you shooting for quantity of time? For myself, I have discovered, you know, for my life, the way my life operates, when y'all guys wake up, I get busy. I mean, that's just the way, you know, in a pastor's life, that's just the way it works. When, when the world starts moving, my phone starts ringing and things start happening. So I get up early every morning, and I do my best to have my daily praying in by the time the world wakes up. And uh, as far as a set time, uh, for myself, I try to pray a minimum of one hour a day. But, you know, so I try to get at least an hour in. Uh, that's my minimum. If, if I can get... Once everybody, you know, if the phone's not ringing and a whole bunch of stuff going on in the morning, sometimes I can get an hour and a half, two hours. But, but I, minimum, an hour a day. Just that's if I don't get my hour, I, I kind of feel out of sorts. And uh, but anyway, so that's how it works for me. Early in the morning, at least an hour. When you get, well, yeah, you're off. Yeah, you're when you get to my age. I do it when I just feel the Lord wants me to do it. Sometimes it's early in the morning. I do a lot of praying on my bed now. Mm -hmm. Now you may find that funny, no, no. but that's where I need to be sometimes. But I find that I just want to get to Jesus whenever I want to get to him. Amen. Yeah. I may just suddenly feel I've got to just Talk to the Lord now. Yeah. And drop everything. Turn anything off, on, whatever it is. And drop it and do it then. Because it's important to talk to the Lord daily. It's important to communicate with Him. Because if we don't communicate with Him, we're done for. If we go a whole day and we haven't communicated with Him then we're done for. So I can't say a set time or how long a time. It's just how I feel I want to talk to Jesus and when. For me, when I get up in the morning, first, before I even get out of bed, I begin to pray. And normally in the mornings, I will pray normally about an hour. During the whole time I'm getting ready for work, I'm praying. I've got praise and worship music on. I'm worshiping the Lord. I'm praying. I'm seeking his face. I'm listening to preaching, you know, before I go to work. And then in the evenings when I get home, I spend probably another hour, maybe an hour and a half praying as well. Because I feel like the Lord has directed me more in the evenings towards my intercession and my spiritual warfare. To where in the mornings I'm building a relationship with him. Starting my day fellowshipping with him and getting to know what he wants me, for me to do during that day. And so... To me, I don't really have a, a certain set time. It's just that whenever I feel the Lord leading me to pray and how he directed me to pray is normally the length of the prayer of the time that I do. I think I'm going to answer just a little differently than y'all did. Um, I know one of the things that Luke said is getting started. <laughs> and I think that if I were um, Luke's age, and I've been there, <clears throat> and I was asked this question, like, how much time do you spend in prayer? And I heard an hour. I would just be so overwhelmed that I would think, how do I get there? Uh, how, do I, how do I do that? Yeah. And, uh, and so I want to say this about the, the amount of time daily, that it's just important that you have a daily. Right. Yes. And um, I know that at one point, um, whenever I was working a 12-hour day job and I had three kids at home and I still did the laundry and I did all of the housework, that in order for me to have 10 or 15 minutes of prayer time was a sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. But I would get up early and that has always been the thing that I would do 
whether my day was going to start at 6 in the morning, whenever I would, at that time, I, was, I think I was clocking in at work around 6 in the morning. I would get up 30 minutes earlier, and I would have the Bible out. And I used to think it was Bible and prayer. But the time that I have in fellowship with him is prayer. And sometimes my prayer time is praying, me talking to the Lord. And it says that I cast my care upon him because he cares for me. And me talking to him about, Lord, I've got this day that's ahead of me, and this is what's going to happen, and I need your grace to get me through this today. And, and what I'm talking to you all about is just the basic of, of getting started, is just learning that he is interested in my day. And I, I just, I remember whenever I was getting up and the kids were still, well, actually, Amanda was um, in college already at that time, and that's Chad's younger sister, and uh, she was in college at that time, and uh, I had gotten up early to that, that morning to pray, and I had the Bible out in front of me, and just talking to the Lord about what was coming up for my day, and I heard him say to me, just praise me for Amanda. And I just began to say everything that I could think of about her, that I thank you, Lord, that she's getting to go to college. Thank you, Lord, that you gave me this wonderful daughter. Thank you, Lord, that your blessings are on her. Everything that I could think of that was good about her and that he'd given me. And I just began to, to tell him how glad I was that she was in my life. And little did I know that he was going to use that very simple prayer to deliver her from being abducted that night. It's a long story, and I'm not going to go into it, but very clearly, it brought about a miracle, and it was just a simple prayer of thanksgiving. And so, for if, if the question is, how do I get started about the amount of time, uh, don't compare your relationship of time with mine. That's right. Compare your relationship of time of, Lord, I just want to be open to you, and I want to talk to you. He is earnestly interested in you. Yes, that's good. Yeah. All right. I want to I add one more thing on that. Um, and we may spend too much time on a few questions and not get very far. But with going along with what you heard Yvonne say, this is how I do it. Brother Wesley say it's morning, evening. Mom say it, I say it. I would ask for all of you married folks, I would ask you this question. How do you communicate with your spouse and how much time is enough and how do you initiate that? And so when I'm praying to the Father, it's a, it's, a, it's a work of intimacy. And so some days, my wife and I have 15 minutes to talk to each other. I'm busy. She's busy. We pass, you know, like two ships and I like Wednesdays. You know, I'm, she's coming in from work. I'm leaving, coming here. And, you know, and I'll see her when I get home. And so, the, you know, our total conversation will probably be for Wednesday. It's probably very utilitarian. It's just... You know, is everything good? Every, you know, how's the day? And see you in a few minutes. Uh, but then other times, it's going to be more long drawn out, more intimate type conversation. So, you know, don't judge everything by some kind of cookie cutter. Right. Yes. How would you communicate to your spouse? At, you know, is it wrong that you have a day that you're both in a hurry and you're both busy? And you only get to visit a little bit. Is that a, a bad, wrong marriage day? No. It's just a day. But then there's also those days when if I don't slow down and take some time to sit and visit with my wife and linger over supper and visit with one another and, and go out and do something in the yard or go to Rogers and spend the weekend or something, it, you know, those things increase that communication. And it's the same way with the Father. You're going to have days when you're going to be busy and it's going to be very utilitarian. It's going to be, you, you say what you got to say for right then, that day, it, it just because you're just shoo, 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 with the busyness of life. But don't also negate those times and moments when you have access to intimacy with the Father. And in those days, spend more time more intimate. So, next question. I may be the only one that has trouble with this. Um, how do you quiet your mind? Mm -hmm. Talk about that. <laughs> yes, I have some. agree with you. Let's start with another. Quiet your mind so that you can get started. Because I know for me, it's, I don't have kids, but I have things in my head that 
everything that I need to do for the day comes up yep. when I'm trying to pray. Absolutely. There's a couple of things that I do. Uh, for me, music is pivotal. Um, I, um, whenever I go, I'm blessed enough to be able to be retired now, and I have me just a place that I go every morning. I've got a place set where I have my Bible, and I don't ever have to put it up if I don't want to. Um, and I've got a computer there, and I turn my music on. And when, um, and I have done this often enough that when I turn my music on, I immediately. Uh, but it took me doing it a, a while, you know, going in there and when I turn the music on, settling down. And um, if this is this may sound weird to y'all, but this helps me sometimes because I still get distracted. Yeah. Um, I still um, will sometimes have to just really work at pulling my mind back in. But there's a video on there of Kenneth Hagen praying in tongues. You put that guy on praying in tongues, and I'm going to hook up praying in tongues too. I'm telling you, <laughs> it just gets me going. So uh, I think you just kind of have to work at what works for, for you. But finding a music that speaks to my heart really is key to getting my mind settled and get me pulled in. Yeah. I have to agree with Sister Peggy because with the with the hours that I work and the stress and everything at work and everything else that we have going on, you have to pull yourself away sometimes. And, and you know, the Bible says, you know, get in your closet and shut the door. Well, I have, I'm like Sister Peggy, I have a place where I can go, I've got a spare bedroom. Where I, and it's called, I've got it actually on the uh, door, it's called my war room, spiritual warfare, where I go in there and I shut my door and I do my very best not to leave that room until I have got my mind at peace with God. And I turn on spiritual uh, music, you know, Christian music, and it may be, it may have words to it, but most of the time I put on instrumental music because I don't want my mind thinking about the words of that song and everything, so I want... The, the Christian instrumental music playing to where my mind begins to be at peace and then when my mind is at peace my body's at peace and when my body's at peace I can get in tune with God and, and get into my really prayer time with Him. So it, it, the music will soothe your mind probably faster than anything else will. Yeah, It brings peace more than anything else that I know of yeah. does for me anyhow. And I'm speaking personally, but that to me is the key for me to let everything else go. And down there, if you see Brother Chad, probably got his prayer show down there. Uh, when I'm at a place to where there's a lot of things distracting me and I've got my prayer show, I put my prayer show on. To me, that's just like getting in the closet and shutting that door. And I don't let anything else to, to distract me when I'm inside that place that I know I need to be at with God. I do my very best. Not to think about what I've got going on outside, what I've got to do tomorrow. If there's things, if I got dishes I need to do, they can wait ten more minutes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but I'm going to spend. I'm going to make myself spend time in prayer and get my mind settled. I'm a little bit different. <laughs> my husband will tell you, I talk to the Lord a lot. Gerard knows. He asked the question, how do we talk to Jesus? And I just simply shut off. If I want to talk to the Lord, that's it. I'm talking to him. Doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter what's around me. I'm talking to him. Because you can't talk to a higher power than our Lord. And so we got to just stop. Just stop. You may be just sort of standing for a few minutes and say, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. He, you ask him. He said, you've stopped again, haven't you? And you're talking to Jesus. Because it doesn't matter, even if you're working. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Yeah. Well, how do we do that? Pray without ceasing. Oh, wow. Because we can pray up here. Amen. Yes. quietly yes. before the Lord. So you may be working and you can stop then and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, do this. Jesus, can you do that? What I'm praying about now, it's just communicating, as pastor said, it's just communicating with him. It's just treating him 
although he's a holy God, it's treating him as if it's somebody, and he is personal, if he's our own personal saviour, but he's personal to us. And we just, that's me. I just stop and say, Jesus, I've got to talk to you now about something. And it, it's really very simple. Amen. Amen. Brother John, help me. What was the name of the monk who wrote the book, Practicing the Presence of God? Brother Lawrence, yes, Brother Lawrence. Yes, Bro, it, it's it's not a very big book. It's called Practice in the Presence. Y'all heard me say from the stage over and over and over, practice his presence, practice his presence. And I picked that up from that book. And what he says, if you read the book, the whole gist of the book is exactly what Sister Yvonne just said. He woke up. He said, thank you, Lord, here I am. He went to bed that night, and he said amen. And his whole life was a prayer. If he was washing dishes, then he was in conversation with the Father. He always just talked to the Father. He never said an amen until he laid down to go to bed. And so driving, walking, whatever he did, anytime his mind got still enough, he was in prayer. And uh, also, you know, and Luke was asked, the question is, how do you get your mind still enough? And uh, sometimes it's effort. Sometimes it's work. Now, I'm the oddball in the group, I think. Music drives me crazy when I'm trying to pray. <laughs> Wednesday mornings, if you come in here and I'm wearing earphones or headphones because everybody else is praying with the music on, it's because it distracts me. Uh, I'm a little distractible. And so I'm the oddball out where I don't want any music when I'm praying. I'm very intent in my prayer, very focused. But one of the things I've learned from a practical standpoint, let's say I'm sitting there and, um, you know, and, and I've got, I'm fixing the kid's bicycle. And I'm down there trying to pray, and it keeps popping in my mind. Fix the bicycle, fix the bicycle. I'll let you stop. Say, all right. I'll work that price, that problem out in my head. Say, fine, I'm done with that now, and go right back to prayer. I've found that oftentimes, if it's a nagging thought like that, sit down, get it over with, work it to its conclusion, and then say, done, get out of here, and then get back down to pray. Instead of fighting it for the whole hour, I'll give it three minutes. And go ahead and work it through to its conclusion and say, fine, that's done. Now let's get back to prayer. And go right back to where I was at in prayer. And so, Because some days it is more of a struggle. You'll know that you're, you'll find that you're more distracted. And it takes a lot more effort. But there are some days, literally, I, while I'm down there praying, I stop and say, shut up. Get out of my head. And I push those thoughts aside, that distraction, and just right back at it. Because I refuse to quit. Amen. I refuse to quit, and I just keep pushing and pushing. Some days it's easier, some days it's harder. There's a uh, man by the name of uh, Brendan Manning. Some of you have seen some of his books, listen to his sermons, and he told this story that there was a man in a, in a parish who was dying, very sick. He didn't know how to pray. And his priest came in and asked him, how, and he asked the priest, how do I pray? And the priest didn't know what to tell him. So Brendan Manning says to him, I'll tell you what to do. Just pull a chair up beside your bed and just talk to the chair like Jesus is sitting in it. Right. Right. And so the man began to do that. Later, Brendan came in to visit with the guy who was a chair sitting there. And uh, he asked him, so what's the chair doing there? And he said, well, I'm doing exactly what you said. I just talked to the chair like Jesus is sitting there. And the guy died. And when the guy died, the guy's daughter calls Brendan on the phone and he says, Tell, tell him, where did you find him when he died? And she said, you know, it was the oddest thing. He was on his hands and knees with his head laying in a chair beside the bed. Yeah. And he crawled out of that chair and laid his head in the lap of Jesus, who he'd yes. always pictured that chair. So it's that, you know, if, even if, if you have to pull up a chair and say, I'm going to talk to this chair like as Jesus said, that's what Sister Yvonne says she does. Talk to him. Like he's sitting right there because he never leaves us or forsakes us. And, and I think sometimes that may make it more intimate. Okay, so nobody hit the thing I was hoping they would hit. Um, it, everything that I've ever needed to do comes to my head when I'm praying. And I get a notebook on my phone or an actual notebook. And I write down my to-do list. Sometimes yeah. I actually make a to-do list while I'm praying. Yeah. Because if I write it down, it leaves me. So, I just yeah. thought maybe my dad would mention that. 
So, you drop the ball. So my next question is: um, So we've covered getting started. So now we're into praying. How much time do you spend praying in English, and how much time do you spend praying in your prayer language or tongues? Um, we'll start with you. I guess. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's a ever changing flux. Um, some days I may pray the whole time in tongues. Other days I may pray very little that day in tongues. Um, and and I and I find myself I float back and forth between the two. I may pray in English a while, pray in tongues a while, pray in English a while, pray in tongues a while. And, and, but more and more, I'm finding myself predominantly praying in tongues. More and more. The deeper I go in prayer, the more I pray in tongues. Um, and going back to the how do you beat the thing in your head, the voices in your head, guys, one of the most powerful things I do in prayer, and I meant to mention this, is I have scriptures. I can tell you I've gone to them so many times. The pages are brown in my Bible where on days when I'm struggling in prayer, I flip to the scripture and I pray the scripture as a prayer. Proverbs chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, Hebrews. I mean, I can go straight to them where I've gone to them and over and over and over. So the days I'm fighting my head, I can read it. I'll pray that scripture predominantly just get after it. But as far as the English and tongues, as tongues as much as possible, as English in English as much as necessary. Well, I'm just a very practical person. I love singing in the shower. And I also speak in tongues in the shower. And I sing away, and that shower lasts a long time. I like a long shower. <laughs> and I sing in tongues in the shower. And I sing in tongues just when I feel the Spirit on me. And it just comes naturally when you just want to commute. We're going back to communicating right. with the Lord. And so the tongues just fall into place, if you like. Mm -hmm. If you actually speak in other tongues, then you should be able to do that at any right. given moment. Right. Because it's all part of who we serve, who we love. Who is beside us? I love that story about his yeah. head on the chair. I thought, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? We can just communicate. Jesus is so real. Mm -hmm. See, what he's got to become is real. Right. Yeah. That's right. He's got to become so real. And I've had over 60 years to find this out. When Jesus becomes so real to us, we can pray, we can speak in tongues, we can do marvelous things because he's given us, sorry, I'm starting to preach now. He's, he, he has given us the authority. He has given us the authority. We belong to him. He's ours. He's got to be so close. Yeah. That you just feel him. He's here with us now yes. in this room. Yes. And he's got to become so close to us that nothing else matters. Now I know I'm retired and a lot of people have to work and do their daily tasks. But it still doesn't stop us being close right. to yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Because whatever you're doing in your workplace... Whatever you're doing, know that he's right by the side of you. Amen. And he sends his angels to take charge of us. Yeah. And he's right there with us. And so it's just easy. Next time you're in the shower, have a singing tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and make the shower last a long time because you get more in that way. And at other times... When, you know, when you're, I was going to say, pottering in the garden, we haven't got a garden really, but uh, a deck full of plants, any time, any time, sorry, that's Peter. How do you follow that? 
<laughs> you know, when, when, when I first started my prayer, prayer life, I, I prayed in English a whole lot. I didn't have my prayer language, and so, you know, I, I, I started growing in just, just the basics, you know, just, Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the peace that you give me. Thank you for your salvation. You know, having a heart of thanksgiving is probably the greatest thing that you can ever have to bring your, to begin your prayer life. Yeah. Because you you learn what you get, what you need to be grateful for, yeah. and you know when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I was driving down the road. I'd been asking the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost for a long time, <clears throat> and I was singing along with the song, and all of a sudden I began to, to pray in tongues. I pulled over on the side road, had to get out of the truck, and I had me a little shout down right there. Because, <laughs> you know what? I just couldn't drive anymore, and and I have learned. That when I, when I, the more that I pray in tongues, the more confident I become. The, the stronger I become in the Word of God. The, the, the more that the Word of God opens up to me because the Spirit searches the deep things of God, the mysteries of God, and He reveals them to us. Yes. And when I, when I begin to pray in tongues, I, I, I can tell when, when I'm praying for myself, I can tell when I'm praying for my family in tongues. And I can t also tell you that the moment that I switch over to intercessory prayer or when I switch over to spiritual warfare, my tongues change. Wow. And so I pray in English sometimes. Very little do I pray in English. And I have learned to, to pray in tongues probably 99% of the time. Because when you pray in tongues, you pray in a language that only you and God knows. Right. Yes. And when you begin to pray in English, it opens sometimes the door for the devil to say, hey, listen, I need to start looking at this area of your life. But when I pray in tongues, he doesn't have a clue what I'm praying. Right. And so for me, I, I pray in tongues probably 99% of the time. And I'm not boasting or anything. But that's just the way the Lord has started building me and directing me into prayer. And I'm telling you, that's changed over the last three weeks even. Uh, my prayers have become more intense. And I have learned that when I pray in English, that I have a hard time really getting intense with my prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. You know, that fervency comes from the groanings of your spirit. And so, yeah. uh, to me, it's praying in tongues. Um, I have to be in agreement with them on the praying. I pray predominantly um, in tongues. And um, and the reason that I, that I do that, um, I think it's been about five years ago, that um, I was challenged by another ministry um, praying for our country. And I was challenged to begin to pray in the Spirit 30 minutes a day, every day. And, um, and so I made that commitment. And uh, when I first did it, and I don't know if y'all have heard the teaching, but I've heard the teaching because I'm from real, real old, old, old school. And, but when I first got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, if you weren't in the Spirit... You weren't supposed to speak in tongues. I don't know if anybody else has heard that teaching, but I had. I was rebuked for praying in tongues while I was doing the dishes. And uh, so I had to kind of relearn some things. And y'all, when we're, when we're saved, we are in the Spirit. Yes. I'm telling you, uh, the, Bible, the Bible says that the plowing of a wicked man is sin. That means whenever, because I am a righteous woman, the brushing my teeth in the morning is a righteous act. Yes. And so I don't have to feel like I'm in the Holy Ghost to be in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm in the Spirit. And, um, but I made that commitment to begin to pray in tongues um, as because I, had, I felt directed of the Lord to do that. And y'all, the most amazing thing happened. I began to have changes in my life like you would never imagine. And uh, such spiritual growth. And I, I thought I was doing this for the fulfillment, for the furtherance of our country. But little did I know that it was going to birth in me such a growth um, and a relationship with the Lord. And I've always prayed in tongues. I have uh, Ever since I got saved, I've always prayed in tongues. But it was when I began to let that be my predominant part of my prayer life that I really began to have a whole new area that opened up to me. Um, when I pray in English, I like Chad talked about praying the scriptures. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says that the word of God is the power of God. And there are some scriptures that I specifically pray. Um, there's one of them that it says that 
that pray that the church fail not. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I've prayed is that the assignment that God has given the church, that the church won't miss it. And so that's one of the things that I pray. And there's another scripture uh, that I pray where it says, pray that godly men will not cease. Yes. And so I pray that there will be godly men that will be birthed and grown up into this land. So I take the word of God and turn it into, into a prayer because it says that the word of God is the power of God. And sometimes it is just strictly confessing the scripture, just reading the scripture out loud and releasing the, those words into the atmosphere. Because when we do, we are releasing the power of God into that situation. Um, there's a scripture in um, Hosea uh, to pray over uh, homes that are in distress where a, a, a spouse that has a, a, a wayward eye, uh, a, a prayer to pray over them that they have their way hedged up. And it's the word of God that is released into that situation and a structure from the word of God, prayer by, from the scripture. And so I predominantly pray in tongues, but there are times that I feel like I need to pray in English. There are times that if somebody says, you know, my sister has cancer, will you pray for her? Then there's been times that I've said, now, Lord, you know I said I'm going to pray for Aunt Janie? So here it goes, and I just pray in tongues, knowing that the Lord's going to sort this out whenever he gets to it. You know, I mean, he's going to put it in the right order. But there are times, because I've said I'm going to pray for a specific person in a specific need, that I will pray over those with the understanding. Because Paul said, there's a couple of things he said about praying. He said, I will pray with my with my." I will pray with tongues, and I will pray with my understanding. So both of them's right. Yes. Both of them's right. But then Paul also said that I thank God that I pray in tongues more than you all. <laughs> so, hey, you know. Okay, so this one is kind of an interesting question. Um. Uh, so there were in um, when Moses is up on the mountain with God, and he and God says, "Step aside, and I'm going to wipe everybody out, and I'm going to start over with you." So Moses pleaded with him and changed his mind, changed God's mind. Have you ever changed God's mind? Mm, that's good. <laughs> Well, it's supposed to start back over here and come back. Y'all look like you don't want to even touch that. You don't. You don't have to be specific. I mean, just. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There's been times that the Lord has said to pray about something, but. The Bible says that when we pray according to his will, he hears us. And there are some things that are set in order. For example, the Bible says that when a land becomes wicked, God withholds the rain. That's what the Bible says. But is it God's will to have to bring a judgment upon the land where his righteous live beside the wicked? So what does he have to have? He has to have an intercessor where it looks like that they are so destined for judgment, but God prefers to give mercy. And so when he finds somebody that will intercede like Moses, why did he choose Moses? Because he knew Moses' heart would be to cry out the very prayer that God was waiting to hear. And uh, I remember that a few years ago, about three years ago, that I was, I had gotten up one Sunday morning and the word abortion had been on my mind a lot. The word abortion had been on my mind a lot. And when I would get down and pray, I would pray, Lord, pray that the, the laws would be stiffened and that people would begin to be aware of what it was. And I began to make intercession about it and God spoke to me. And he spoke to me that word and I went and I looked at the news and when I found, I found a place that in Arkansas, that week, the law had changed. And I think the reason the Lord even said that word is because my prayer 
made a difference. Yes. Amen. My prayer made a difference. Yes. Yeah. Your prayer makes the difference. That's right. And I think that God puts strategic people in strategic places, every one of us being his strategics. Every one of us. And so that he can tell us, this wicked thing right here, this wicked sin right here, will somebody please cry out that I don't have to send a judgment? Yes. So that's what I think happened there. I think that he chose Moses because he knew that Moses would cry out that God would not have to send judgment. Oh boy. <laughs> as far as changing God's mind, I, no, I don't think that I have ever been to a place in prayer yet to where I have actually changed God's mind. Um, you know, has God used me to pray an intercessory prayer over different people and actually see, see their entire lives change? Absolutely. Yes. Has God used me to pray over church services and see atmospheres change? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But as far as changing God's mind over a certain situation, no, I do not believe that I have prayed a prayer like that yet. If I have, I do not know of it. But I'm also new in, in, in learning this intercessory prayer in different roles and the, the, how it moves God. And the more I get into it, the deeper and the stronger the draw is for me to get deeper into it and to understand the, the, the power behind intercessory prayer and how it can change God's mind. If, if Moses can change the mind of God and, and can stop judgment, we have that same power working on the inside of us. That's right. Yeah. It depends on how deep we want to go in our walk with God and develop our prayer lives to be able to see that take place. But I do believe it is possible in each and every one of our lives if we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is God is Alpha and Omega, mm -hmm. the beginning and the end. So God knows everything about everything and whether I can change his mind on something I too am not absolutely certain that I can but I can pray that I might be able to change it see if he's already ordained he's Alpha and Omega he's already the beginning and the end if he's already ordained can I change it? Now we can change circumstances and things. I'm going to relate to my, my dear sweet husband. Once upon a time, we were invited to take a church on. He had a business of his own, uh, quite a good business, and we were doing quite well for ourselves. We were a two-car family which is quite uh, rare in the UK, not over here. <laughs> but, uh, we were a two-car family and so on. And somebody, he went to a meeting with some ministers and they said to him, oh, Brother John, you ought to take this church on. And John said, uh-uh, -oh. nah, I'm quite happy with my business, he said. I don't want to do that. So he came home and he told me. And boy, did he get a look. <laughs> I said, what? You said no without praying about it? And he said, yes. He said, because I'm quite happy in our business. And we're quite happy where we are. We've got what we need for, you know. And, he, and, and I must say, at that particular time, we were running a, um, a church. I did forget that. So we were running a church, but working at the same time. And I went before God and I said, Lord, you've got to change his mind. You've got to change his mind. We've got to pray about this. We have got to seek your face. And so I started seeking the Lord myself and asking the Lord to change his mind. And boy, I'm glad we did because that's the church we left in England. 
that is another testament in itself. But yes, yes we can change things, but we have to pray about them. Right. And we have yeah. to seek the face of God, whether it yeah. is his will that we do that or we don't do that. Amen. Do we change his mind? I think so at times. But I would say very rarely. If he's got it all planned and purpose already. Right. So the simple answer is, not that I know of. No. Now, but I want to answer the question this way. So we read that, and I've often looked at that scripture. It said, Moses changed the mind of God. But I want to ask rhetorically, did he change the mind of God? It is my personal opinion that the mind of God is many faceted. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. God is a God of peace, but he himself says, I am a man of war. So there's a multifaceted mind of God. And I have to ask myself the question, is he a God of redemption? Absolutely. And when he's standing there talking to Moses, he's speaking as a God of judgment. Move out of the way, I will kill them all, and I will create a nation out of you. But I think my, the more I've looked at this over the years, I've looked at this scripture so many times. I believe what he's doing that you have the heart of judgment that is being revealed to inflame the heart of an intercessor to enact the heart of redemption. Right. Yeah. And so here God is saying, if these people don't change, I must, in judgment, fulfill what I'm telling you. Yeah. But my heart of mercy and redemption is pushing Moses to cry out to me so I can kick in with redemption because I have to have an intercessor on the earth. And so, yes, he changed the mind of God from, from vengeance and from wrath and from judgment to a heart of mercy. He did make that switch. And so how many times in our own life have we prayed for the lost? Yeah. Yeah. And the Father's looking at them and saying, you know what? If somebody doesn't cry out for them, then my heart of judgment, they're going to stand before me as a just God and they're going to go straight to hell and I'm going to cast them into the lake of fire. But yet I'm going to put it on Scott's heart because my heart of redemption is looking for someone to inflame it. And so Scott begins to fall on his face and we and pray an intercession and now things begin to change. Amen. And that person comes in and, be, and gets saved. And so I think, have I ever changed the heart of the Father? I don't know. I don't know. But I can tell you this, I, I have, um, I've prayed hard. Yeah. I'll just, I'll leave it right there yeah. to do exactly that. Yeah. So, DJ's got her hand up back there. I, I just wanted to say that we can back up everything you've all said about that with that one scripture that says, if my people, my yeah. people will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, repent of their sins. Then, then, if, then, the if, then, yeah. Okay, so, um, on, when, when Jesus teaches the disciples the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. so he teaches them basically a template, pray in this manner. Right. Is there a template that you guys use? Obviously, that one is a good one. Um, but is there a template that you guys use, maybe not even now, but on in the beginner phase when you're trying to figure out what to pray to to get up to that half hour, because a lot of people are thinking, I'd pray every word I ever knew in a half hour. <laughs> what template do you guys use or suggest to get people from that laying down to sleep prayer phase up to that half hour, that transition? Oh, so there's a, there's a lot of different prayer templates, if you want to call them that out there. I do use the Lord's Prayer still to this day. Some days I will pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, and you break it down into different levels and, you know, there's ways to do that. The one, my, my preferred favorite is I use the temple. 
I pray through the temple, pray through the seeker's gate, through the altar of repentance, through the labyrinth, move again to the, uh, to the showbread, to the menorah, to the altar of incense, and then move into the holy place. And, there, and there's a template that I use to pray through the temple. There's a lot of different ones out there. And when you're, if you're getting started, if the temple's got one, seven different spots. If you pray five minutes per spot in that temple, you pray 35 minutes. And it's easy to pray five minutes. Uh, you know, Father, I seek your face. Then five minutes for repentance. Then five minutes for wash me with the water of the washing of the word. Show me your word. Open your word. You know, you can do that very simply. And uh, so there's a lot of different templates out there, but the two I use is the Lord's Prayer in the temple. Well, I'm just hesitating a little bit because thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And my prayer daily is his kingdom will come to this earth so it will be so moved by the power of God that I love, I love that prayer. That prayer, I'm going to use that prayer now. It got us through real bad circumstances. When John had his stroke and couldn't speak properly, we sat together and I said the Lord's Prayer to him daily. And I said, now you're going to say the Lord's Prayer with me. And we said it, and we said it, and we said it until he was speaking properly. The Lord's Prayer means a lot to us. A lot. But a man couldn't talk properly. Now he's saying the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. So, I love the Lord's Prayer. I love the Gospels. When I think of Jesus, I go through them. When I think of Jesus and his love and his compassion and all that he offers us there in the Gospels, there's so much of the Word of God that we can take with us daily in prayer. But I love the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Is that what you're waiting for? Because that's what I'm waiting for. Right. Right. I'm 76 years of age, and I'm waiting for the kingdom of God to come on this earth till we have such a revival all over the world that we'll see God move in a tremendous way. So I like, I go through the Gospels, I like John because I like to read about Jesus yeah. and what he did in those four Gospels. Of course, we like the book of Acts because, ah, oh, plugged in. The book of Acts, the power, the power. So, that's about me. If you want to add the light to you. <laughs> so easy. For me, when I first started out, I, I of course... You know, everybody's probably going to say, you know, the Lord's Prayer. Yes, by far. I, I learned by that. But I also learned by writing my own prayer down. I, I would take a sheet of paper and I would write down a prayer. And then when, when and it may be, you know, it, I may have started with a 10-minute prayer. But then I added to it. And before I knew it, I had three or four pages that I would begin to pray. Uh, and then once I started to really get into a, a prayer routine, I should say, and not a ritual, but a routine in learning how to pray that, that prayer over and over and over, then I became, then I found the real template, which is the Word. Right. And I began to pick up the Word of God and find different uh, chapters and different verses in there that I would add to my, my template that I had. And then I would, I would build on that. And so that, that's the way I got started. Now, uh, I don't know if you ever, any, how many of you in here heard of Dr. Cindy Trim? Dr. Cindy Trim has got many, many uh, different templates of prayer. If you want to go into spiritual warfare, if you're praying for somebody for healing, if you're praying for somebody who's getting, 
uh, uh, deliverance or anything like that. She's got many prayer templates out there. And I use those sometimes. But uh, getting started, uh, I, I just wrote my prayers down. And they, they may have been so simple. And at first, you know, you're thinking, is that really a prayer? But it is. Because yes. it came from your heart. Right? Yes. And so the thing is, you pray from your heart. And then you build off of it. Because the more you pray, and the more you develop yourself in prayer, the longer your prayers are going to be. You're going to find out that five minutes will turn into 15 minutes, turn into 30 minutes in no time at all. Then you're going to think after an hour, I just got here. I mean, because that's how that's how real prayer becomes to you, is that when, when you start building your prayer and it gets down on the inside of you, it's hard to get up from prayer now. Because it becomes personal. And it becomes real to your life. And you begin to see the results of the prayer that you started from a one paragraph prayer. Has now become an hour to two hour prayer. So it, you just have to build on it. It's not a, a, I'm not saying that there's a certain way you have to pray. But pray how you feel you need to pray. Right. And allow the Holy Spirit to build you in your prayer life. And build that template in you. Right, right. I just want to add a little bit to what they have said. Um, I have personally used the Larry Lee uh, Guide to Prayer, which is a breakdown of the Lord's Prayer. You can go online and just type in uh, Larry Lee Lord's Prayer uh, PDF, and uh, you can find it. You can find one of those templates that it, it, it breaks down each aspect of the Lord's Prayer, and it'll say like. Um, where where it prays, lead us not to temptation. It'll it'll say you know here you know here we're going to pray about uh, not sinning and asking for forgiveness and do it. And so it's going to give you a, a very specific kind of guideline that you can fill in. And uh, I have found out for myself personally, it seems like we're always in a stage of transition. And it seems like sometimes when we're going through a transition, sometimes to me it gets difficult. Sometimes when I'm going, when the Lord is is moving me from this point to the next point. Prayer becomes a struggle. Yeah. And so it, to me, is really, um, it, it, every once in a while, I'll go back to this. I'll pull it out again and begin to use it again uh, because it helps to, to keep me faithful. It helps to keep me faithful in prayer during those times where I don't feel it, if that <laughs> makes any sense right there. So... <coughs> But there's also the one that he was talking about, temple prayer. You can find a, a, a free PDF um, on the computer. Just type in uh, Paul Yonggi Cho, temple prayer, and you can bring up a PDF of, of free. You won't have to pay anything for it. Just print it off. And those are excellent guides for it, whether you're just starting out praying or whether you've prayed for 50 years. Those are excellent guides to be able to use, and they're easy to access. It's uh, Larry Lee, uh, the Temple Prayer, Paul Yonggi Cho. Yonggi, Y-O-N-G-I, is one name, and then Cho, C-H-O. In fact, um, Alan, if you'll just holler at me, I think I'll have a copy at home, and I can maybe print you off one. Okay. All right. So, um, getting close to the end here. So I've got a couple questions that just any one of you can answer, uh, just kind of like just an answer. Um, I mean, you can elaborate, but um, all four of you don't have to answer it. Um, and the first one is, is um, why do we see people praying under a prayer shawl? Well, you see, here's mine. Um, it's, it's almost like my security blanket. I never leave home without it. And uh, a lot of people ask me that question. Why do you use this thing? And I will tell you this. It has absolutely no power, but it has great significance. Amen. And uh, it goes back to what Wesley said. Um, Y'all, I've been pastor a long time, so this is a truth that I will give you that you know to be real. Uh, I'm a little ADD. And so if you're standing there talking to me and somebody's holding a conversation too close, I will turn my head and look and see what they're saying. I mean, it just that's just who I am. I'm wired a little tight sometimes. 
And so this is, yeah, so this is my prayer closet. I didn't realize it was that obvious. <laughs> but this is my prayer closet. And so when I, if, if, like on Wednesday mornings, if I get down there in prayer, I pull that dude over my head. And if people walking around, some people like to walk and pray, that wears me out. Some people like to, you know, that's Nana, she knows. But, that, but I can pull under there, pull that thing down around my head, and you walk all you want to, and I don't even know this, because I'm in the box. I used to use a box. Before I got a shawl, I had a cardboard box I'd stick my head in. So I could just, but I, you know, I'm kind of like a horse that needs blinders, you know, it just keeps me focused. Brother so Seymour horse done horse. that too, didn't he? Do what? Brother Seymour done that too. Brother Seymour did that too, and they get the same problem. So, uh, but anyway, so it has no power, uh, but it does have great significance. It does have some spiritual significance in its Jewish representations and stuff. But for me personally, what it does is it pulls me into the heart of the Father. I use it, I, I'm in my office by myself, and I'm under my prayer shawl because I've just become so accustomed to it. And it just pulls me down to the heart of the Father where everything else is boxed out, and it allows me to just focus being Father. So that's the reason I use it. Okay, second. Um, a lot of people think that it's wrong to pray uh, for provision. Is it okay to pray for provision? Uh, it absolutely is correct to pray for provision. Um, in the Lord's Prayer, it said, it, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, there's other places where it says, it says you ask, um, yeah, yeah, you ask, you have not because you ask not. Um, and I think that it is pleasing to the Lord that we ask him about all of the things of our life. I'm going to give a real, real quick story. Uh, when Chad was young, um, the Lord had, had me give away. I just bought Chad a, prayer, a brand new pair of shoes. And uh, the lady down the road had a boy that actually he and Chad played together all the time. But he needed a pair of shoes. And the Lord said, give her Chad's shoes. And I said, oh, Lord, we need those shoes. But he said, give them. So I gave them. And so I got down and I prayed. And I said, Lord, we need a pair of shoes. And we need a pair. And I told him what size I'd like for them to be. Because we always wanted a little bit of growing room. And I wanted them to be brown. And I wanted them to be real leather and lace up. And before long, a pair of shoes came to my front door. Exactly what I had asked for. I didn't have to go shopping for them. Amen. But I asked the Lord for them. And he provided them. Amen. 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 John and I, many years ago, were evangelists. And it wasn't, we were prosperous evangelists or tele evangelists. And we traveled all over the UK. And many a time we were really, when we went to a church, we were glad they paid for the gas. We call it petrol. But, uh, we were glad they paid for the gas and nothing else sometimes. And I can remember uh, one, I could tell you lots of stories, but we haven't got time tonight. But I remember one time we had nothing on our table to eat. Now I know we don't look like it now, but we had nothing on our table to eat. And so we sat at the table and we prayed. And we said, Lord, we'd like to eat today. The church we were attending, bless our hearts, just covered the gas and that was it. And so we said, we'd like to eat. And a knock came at our front door. And there was my dear mother-in-law standing on the doorstep. And she said, oh, she said, I was just getting some groceries today. She said, and I thought, let's go down to John and Yvonne's and share it with them and give them some lunch or dinner, whatever it was at the time. She said, and I've just brought this for you. Now, she didn't know. We didn't pass that on. We prayed. Amen. Now, see, sometimes we can pass it around. And that helps. Because someone else 
See, we've learned one secret as well, if I may just add this. The Lord, now we use pound notes in Britain, but we better say dollar bills here now. God doesn't manufacture dollar bills. You don't look up to heaven and see him woof, 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 coming down, do you? We once attended a crusade and a man said, I admire anybody that works by faith, and we were, and I mean that. He said, I admire anybody that works by faith. He said, I wouldn't give anything to anybody that works by faith. So I looked at him and I said, well, where do you think faith comes from? I said, God speaks to the hearts of men and women. Right. And something gets provided for somebody that needed it. He looked at me and he said, well, I'm not doing that. And I thought, well, God bless you, brother, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but see, sometimes we go to God directly and say, I have got a need right now, Lord. This has got to be met. We're, you know, we're... Whatever. But sometimes you may just mention something to somebody and they may just hear the voice of the Lord and he says, Oh, yeah. I can bless that person. I've heard many stories like that as well. Oh, boy. I could keep you here all night. The stories of, of people that have been blessed through others and been blessed directly from the Lord, as it were, because you've only asked him. But then he has gone and spoken to somebody else. So we can ask for provision, yes, because we have needs of all sorts. It may not be financial, it may not be for food, it may be for something else, but we have to have the faith, coming back to faith now, that God will provide. Amen. I'm going to just share real briefly. When Susan and I was, were first married in 1988, two years later we had come to a point that we needed a, a vehicle. I was walking back and forth to work. She was walking back and forth to work. And we, we began to, to pray and ask God, you know, for help. You know, we were doing everything we could, you know, struggling as, a, as newlyweds. Um, and a man came up to us at church one day and said, you know, the Lord laid it on my heart to give you all this car. Wow. Yeah. Come on. Was, it, was it a new car? Was it a, a car that, you know, was just, you know, great to die to look at? No. But it was a car. Yeah. Yes. It met the need. God had, had heard our cry, had heard our prayer, saw the need in our life, and the car was given to us. Amen. We took that car and, you know, we did some upkeep on it. We did our best for it. And when the Lord blessed us to where we could buy another car, there was another couple in the church uh, that needed a vehicle, so we turned right around and gave it to them. Yeah. You know, because I believe that the Lord gave it to us to be a blessing to us. And in turn for us, we need to turn around and do the same thing to others. Yeah. So to pray for provision, Absolutely. I can tell you stories that my mother and my grandmother and grandfather had, had told me uh, a lot like what Sister Yvonne was saying about how God had provided in their life. And if you think back in your life, you'll find out somewhere, somehow, God has made provisions for your life, whether you realize it now or not. If you'll just really stop and think, God has provided for you in many ways. So many ways that, that you know, your provision of salvation, your provision of healing and deliverance and setting us free and so many things God has provided. Like she said, provision is not just, you know, finances. It can be for many different things in your life. If we all think about it, God has provided for each and every one of us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, last question. Um, and one person can answer or somebody else has some more input. Um, how important is it for your kids to see you pray? I'll answer that one just very simply. Very, very, very. They will do what they see you do before they do what you say. Amen. And I think we need to be visible in prayer. We need to be visible in worship. 
Uh, we need to be visible in all of those aspects. Uh, you know, I know the Bible says, don't let the left hand know what your right hand's doing. And that is important. <coughs> but I think it is exceedingly important, especially in the day and age we're living in, where everything else in the, under the sun is on media and in the face of our kids. I think it's exceptionally important that our children see us Pentecostal. It's the reason why, if you'll notice, every third Sunday, we don't have children's church because our children come in big church because they must be raised identifying with prayer, with the glory, with Pentecost, with tongues, with interpretation of tongues. Um, how dare we raise a generation that knows all the Bible stories, but they don't know the God of the Bible stories. Amen. And so we just made the decision. Those young lions will learn to roar in this auditorium, and that's the reason we do that, so they can be exposed to, to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That, I'm going to ask how important is it. You know, everybody knows I got riding with me all the time. He was not raised in church. And I bring him with me on Wednesdays, and now every time we sit down to eat dinner, <coughs> on his own, he prays for his mother, his sister, and his brother to join him in church. He'll be five when he's finished. Yeah. He's seen me. <coughs> Watch me walk and clap my hands. Well, a little girl walked in and clapped my hands, and I heard his little hands clap behind me. Yeah. He's, He's learning. learning. He's very, learning. Very important. Scott? Yeah, that, that's, this kind of leads into the question that I've had all night long. Um, we're known as a this generation coming up as a fatherless generation. The fathers have been taken out of the house, and... I, I, my feelings on it and I ask what y'all's feelings the enemy <coughs> has split these homes took the father out which is the head of the house in aims to shorten the relationship between us and God uh, our prayer life in between because if you don't learn how to talk to your earthly father how could you ever learn how to talk to God because yeah. that's the relationship that is that, that has been that was set and forged and to build on to be able to talk do you do you all feel the same way I do that that was a tactic of the enemy to shorten that the ability to go into prayer Yes. The consensus of what looking down the road and everybody's nodding their head. You want to answer that? Yeah, I, I will say this. We are in a time, um, it is, has been prophesied that there will be a billion soul revival um, that is actually has already begun. But that in this, that many of those will be the youth, the young people. And I think that where what the uh, devil has tried to do, he has tried to destroy. Um, the, my goodness, whenever I look at all the things that have gone on in the last few years, I think my heart breaks for children. And God said he called Abraham because Abraham would teach his children about how, you know, how to walk holy and, and how to know God. And so God chooses, I mean, he really uh, looks uh, kindly upon the people that will raise their children to know him. But I think that because of the lack of the father in the home, that there's going to be a cry for a father. And I believe that that's going to be where the devil has tried to use that to destroy a generation, that that will be one of the very things when they see yes. that there is a heart of a father in heaven yes. that they can turn to, that that will be one of the reasons that the youth are going to come with such strength into the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. There's, uh, we're, we're running out of time. And there's several questions that we didn't get to answer. You know, why do we pray? What's the difference between intercession, spiritual warfare, personal prayer? Uh, has God ever said, don't pray for someone? Uh, what frustrates us sometimes in prayer? And then one that should prayer ever be stressful to the person that's praying? And uh, so I'm going to just, in a way, closing, kind of tie up some stuff here just very quickly. But when it says, why, would, why do I pray? Why would I not? Yeah. Yes. Right. That the, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. But I'm going to tell you, unless you put your prayer to it, 
you might as well not even pick it up. Uh, and, well, no, I don't want to say that. I, I, I spike my tongue. Pick it up and read it, but get your prayer life into it. Yes. Right. It will only be a book until you learn to pray. That's yes. what I meant to say. Yeah. It will only be a book until you pray. Why would I not pray? Heaven and earth hangs in the balance. Yes. And the only way we set the balance right is in prayer. Amen. I'm telling you. Um, and, and, and Mark, this one's the answer to Mark's question. Should ever, prayer ever become stressful to the person praying? And uh, I, I know my prayer life is different than a lot of other people's. Uh, but if you want to see an example of what it looks like for prayer to be stressful, come be here at 845 on Wednesday morning. That's right. <laughs> there is a warfare in prayer. Uh, I do pray peaceful prayers at times, but I will assure you, there are days I pray till I sweat through my clothes sometimes. I pray till my feet go numb and I can't get up off the floor. I pray until I scare the people around me. I pray till I scare myself sometimes. And I do it because hell is my mortal enemy. Yes. Right? Yes. And I intend to devoid it of souls. And I can only do that when I spend time in prayer. Yes. If I got sweat, we really move. They sent him a letter one time and said, we pray, we pray, we pray. Nothing changes. And he sits back, why don't you try tears? Yeah. Yes. That's not happy lay me down to sleep prayers. Yes. And so uh, I, will, I will assure you there is a difference. We don't have time to go through it all night. Intercession, spiritual warfare, personal prayer. There's a difference. But I will assure you uh, there is a difference. And you can come to the place in prayer where you go from being here to there, from being external to internal, from being, uh, I don't know how else to put it, from outside the heart of the Father to inside the heart of the Father, hooked up, sort on, moving in. You can get there. It's not just for a few of us. It's right. for all of us. So find a place in prayer. Get in there. Why would you not? Yes. The Pastor, king. Yeah, go talking ahead. about tears. Do you remember the vision? I had a vision of Atkins, the four wells, yeah. north, yeah. east, south, and west. Yeah. And the vision was that there wasn't enough water in the right. well, meaning there was no tears right. being shed right. to fill the, the wells up. And those wells were the wells of salvation. Yes. So I agree with that. Yes. We've got to shed more tears. Yes. We've got to plead and shed more tears and cry unto God. Yes, sorry to interrupt. I'm not back here because I'm about to go to Rome. And we're too late. So I can feel the preach coming on. So, and I can preach a whole sermon just on those last few questions. So uh, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here tonight. Listen, find a place in prayer. Find a place in prayer. As we're closing, let's all bow our head in prayer. Father. Tonight, our purpose here has been to encourage one another. The scripture calls it iron sharpening iron. Father, right now, I rebuke any spirit of condemnation that would try to come upon any person sitting in this room that says, I can't do it like they do it. I can't do it that much, that time, whatever. Father, I rebuke a lying spirit of condemnation. I rebuke it and cast it out of this place. Father, I declare over these people, these are sharp two-edged swords. Father, I declare over these people right now, they know your heart. They hear your voice. These are a people of prayer. Father, I declare your word says, if my people will humble themselves and pray. And I declare we will be a people who humble ourselves and pray. We will be a people who meet you in our prayer chambers. We will be a people who are mindful, totally in your presence all the time, carrying the sword of prayer along with this word. Father, there are a thousand souls still yet lost. We're still seeking after them. We will be a people who will weep and cry at the altar. We will be weeping warriors. We will rend the heavens with our prayer till revival comes down and consumes us. Yeah. Father, I pray that for other, every person under the sound of my voice as they leave this house, that it will be as a burning fire in their belly, that it will be as if it burns them, draws yes. them to the altar. They fall on their face before you at least for a moment every day. Jesus. In the name of Jesus, that we be a church in one mind and one accord, changing this world in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. God bless each and every one of you. We'll see you right here Sunday morning, 945 for Sunday school.